Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much indeed, of course, for reminding everybody just how old I am and how long I've been around, <coughs> which makes me feel even old when I look around at such a young audience today. Uh, the subject I've chosen is uh, deliberately topical, not least in the context of Libya and the intervention there, and I'll come back to that live case study in a few minutes. But I want to start by stepping back a little bit from the, the controversies of today to the theory of humanitarian intervention and how we got to where we are now. And I do so because that's an issue in which I've long had an interest, both from my days in the Foreign Office and as advisor to two Prime Ministers, but recently and more intensely as uh, the, the UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs from 2007 to 2010. I'll touch on various examples of where we could have intervened but we didn't, and at some where we might not have intervened but we did, and I'll try to draw a few conclusions. And in particular, I'll be suggesting that the idea of humanitarian intervention, however attractive it is at first sight, and however vital it might be in some circumstances, is something we need to handle with great care, perhaps greater care than we've done in the past. Now, the issue is in many ways simple, but it's also, of course, very complicated. The simplicity comes from where we start with this uh, to, to a large extent these days, which is what happened in Rwanda, the massacre in Rwanda in 1994, when the international community wrung its collective hands over what was happening, but effectively did nothing to stop it. Now, the issue of what to do about terrible events in another country had, of course, come up many times before in the past in one way or another, but it's Rwanda that crystallized the current debate in its very clear form. Just to remind you, uh, some 800,000 people, mostly Tutsis, were killed over a 100-day uh, period, mostly hacked to death by machetes, despite global condemnation and despite the presence in Rwanda at the time of a UN force containing French and Belgian troops. And a very strong and widespread reaction after that event and since was never again. In other words, the international community should never again stand by idly while a country's citizens were slaughtered. It was simply not acceptable for such things to take place in the 20th century as it then was. And in the time-honoured phrase, something had to be done. Now, this reaction, while widespread and certainly international, was by no means universal. It was uh, indeed, to a large extent, a Western reaction, at least as far as governments concerned. Many governments in the developing world, with the support of other countries like Russia and China, continued to take the view that while obviously events like the Rwanda genocide had to be condemned, the key principles of the primacy of national sovereignty and the unacceptability of interference in the internal affairs of another country, those key principles should not be prejudiced and had to be preserved. Humanitarian concerns should not become a sort of intervener's charter, providing an excuse for Western countries to intervene whenever they felt like it, without regard to international law or, for example, the role of the United Nations Security Council. And I'll come back to these arguments a little bit later. They do, of course, echo a wider and a more long-standing argument about the universal applicability of human rights standards and the legitimacy of the international community in insisting on their application in the internal affairs of a particular country. In any case, the point is, whatever these doubts may have been, uh, there was a, a new focus on this uh, because of Rwanda. And I want to focus on two significant moments in this debate since then. One was, uh, came from former Prime Minister Tony Blair, uh, and the second was the UN World Summit in 2005. Now, Tony Blair, uh, in a now famous speech in Chicago in, a in April 1999, set out what became known, at least for a while, as the Blair Doctrine. Uh, I should make clear this was after I stopped working for him, so I take no blame or credit for what he said, or indeed did. <coughs> and the context of this was the NATO intervention in Kosovo at the time, and the bombing campaign against Serbia, which was not producing uh, at that particular moment, that hoped for results. So he spent quite a lot of the speech defending the NATO intervention as a just war against the evil of ethnic cleansing. But he also put it in the context of the need for new rules for international cooperation, new rules for international action in the post-Cold War age of interdependence. And he saw the most pressing foreign policy issue of the day, this is in 1999, as identifying the circumstances in which we, and I think by the we, he meant the international community, not the West, uh, should get it actively involved in other people's conflicts. He emphasized that the principle of non-interference had to have its limits. We could not right every wrong in the world at the same time, so we did have to decide what we could and what we should do. And he set out five major considerations which he thought 
would need to be satisfied before we intervene militarily in a particular area. First of all, are we sure of our case? Secondly, have we exhausted all the diplomatic alternatives and given peace every chance? Thirdly, are there military operations that can be sensibly and prudently undertaken? And I would add, successfully. Fourthly, are we prepared for the long term, not just the immediate uh, short term issues? And fifthly, do we have, the countries involved that is, do we have national interests involved? He added that the United Nations had to be the central pillar of all this and of international cooperation in general, but that the new ways it had to be found to make the UN and the Security Council not become deadlocked in the way that they so often had been during the Cold War. So that was the Blair Doctrine of 1999. The second de key development came from uh, the debate which was um, uh, launched, in effect, by this speech. Uh, the, the then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan asked the international community to do more to define the conditions for humanitarian intervention. And this in turn led to the establishment of an international commission on intervention and state sovereignty by the Canadian government and their report in 2001 on something which you've no doubt heard of called the responsibility to protect. Now this, uh, this turned the sovereignty argument on its head. It developed the idea of sovereignty, national sovereignty as responsibility. In other words, responsibility for the welfare of the citizens of a particular state. And it said that where a government was unable to exercise that sovereignty properly, in other words, unable to protect its own population effectively, the principle of non-intervention should yield to that of an international responsibility to protect that population. But again, it attached four conditions to that. First of all, the intentions had to be right, in other words, genuine. Secondly, it had to be a last resort, this kind of intervention. Thirdly, only proportional means should be used. And fourthly, there should be, again, reasonable prospects of success. And the report also emphasized the crucial role of the Security Council in authorizing any intervention. Now, there was a long and difficult debate after this report came out, but the UN World Summit in 2005 finally adopted unanimously, as part of an outcome document, two important paragraphs on this responsibility to protect. It became known as R2P for short, rather than uh, responsibility to protect. And these two paragraphs said, in essence, that it was for each state to protect its population from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. And that the international community should help and encourage states to fulfill this responsibility. But that if states manifestly fail to do this and fail to protect their populations, then the international community had the, peace, had the responsibility to use appropriate peaceful means to try and make it happen, and if all else fails, to intervene in other, uh, in other ways through the Security Council. Now this was a significant step in many ways. Indeed, it was a breakthrough in international consideration of this and international readiness to set out when intervention could be justified. And the campaigners uh, for this greeted it with some jubilation at the time. But it quickly became clear this was not actually the end of the argument. Many states which had agreed to this outcome and signed up to the World Summit outcome document seemed to suffer almost immediately from buyer's remorse. They wanted to forget what they'd signed up to because of their fear, a, a, a justified fear in many ways, of how this language might be used in the future. And of course the context at that stage was the aftermath of the invasion of Iraq by a US-led coalition without Security Council authorization and the continuing military intervention in Afghanistan, which was authorized by the UN in 2001 after 9-11, although on counter-terrorism rather than on humanitarian grounds, but was proving increasingly difficult and controversial, as of course it still is. So there's been a long and continuing discussion since 2005 about whether and how this World Summit, these, these two paragraphs about responsibility to be to protect, should be operationalized, should be turned into reality. And many questions have been asked during this period about whether particular situations in the world, for example, Zimbabwe under President Mugabe and many others, whether they fit the responsibility to protect scenario. And if they don't, why don't they? And why isn't the international community doing something? There's a strong lobby group led by former Australian Foreign Minister Gareth Evans in, in favour of the frequent use of R2P, in other words, in favour of robust military intervention. But the objections based on the sacred principles of sovereignty and non-interference have certainly not gone away. So now what does all this mean in reality now? Are we confident that we would now act to prevent another Rwandan genocide? Have we gone backwards, perhaps, even, 
because of the toxic legacy of Iraq? Or on the contrary, have we unleashed in R2P a kind of a diplomatic monster which we can't control and which may lead us back into more international adventures uh, than we can deal with or that we would ever really want? Before I come to Libya, let me just highlight some of the, the points of contention which are always brought up whenever this issue of humanitarian intervention is discussed. First of all, what do we mean by humanitarian? Uh, obviously, this uh, refers in the first place to avoidance of loss of civilian life and reduction of suffering. But how great does a threat of that have to be, and who is going to rule on the, the true extent and the nature of that threat in any particular situation? Now, it's worth noting that it's usually politicians and, to some extent, human rights campaigners and not humanitarian organisations themselves who press for military intervention on humanitarian grounds. The humanitarian organisations are often not at all convinced, except perhaps in absolutely clear-cut and appalling cases like that of Rwanda, that military intervention is going to be the right answer. They themselves fear too close association with the military because that makes it harder to maintain their neutrality and their independence. They're also aware that military action which is designed to protect one lot of civilians may end up harming and killing another lot of civilians, however inadvertently. And they also observe, as do many others, that those who argue most strongly for humanitarian intervention in a particular case may well seem to have other more political motives in mind as well, more or less worthy and more or less explicit. Second is the question which I've already touched on of who should decide when a situation merits intervention. Now, the obvious answer is the United Nations Security Council. It has the mandate, it has the legitimacy to do so, and no other body has that. And this is, of course, the ideal scenario. But if the Security Council cannot agree, what then? The purists argue that there can be no legitimate intervention without the Security Council by definition, and that there therefore should be no intervention at all. Others suggest that legitimate intervention can still be possible if uh, agreement in the Security Council is unreasonably blocked by one or more states acting, for example, for motives of obvious self-interest or a close relationship with the country in question. The intervention in Kosovo in 1999, for example, was not approved by the Security Council because it was known, or was at least thought to be known at the time, that the Russians would veto any re resolution to approve it because of their close relationship with the Serbs. But it did have wide European and, to some extent, wide international support otherwise. And therefore, it aroused much less controversy than the case of Iraq, because in the case of Iraq, it was already clear that there wasn't enough support in the Security Council even to get a majority of votes, never mind whether there might have been an, an unreasonable veto by one country or countries later on. And the fact is that international law is not really well developed in areas like this, whatever the lawyers may tell you. So a pure legal view is not and cannot be the end of st the story. How, for example, are we supposed to deal with a preemptive intervention when the threat is essentially a matter of political judgment, not susceptible to any objective test, and certainly not covered by international law as it stands? But I'm uncomfortably aware that this idea that you can somehow authorise and legitimate uh, an intervention without the Security Council is very precarious ground. In any case, the uncomfortable reality for now is that it's almost always going to be the countries of the West. You know what I mean by the West, although the definition is a bit weird these days. <coughs> it's always, al almost always going to be the countries of the West effectively taking the lead when humanitarian intervention is discussed. Many developing countries have too much else to worry about to devote time and energy to what's happening outside their own borders, except perhaps in the case of an immediate neighbour. They don't usually have their own media or lobby groups pressing them to act and they probably don't have the military and financial resources to allow them to do so anyway. But in any case, they're much more likely to be concerned about this sovereignty and non-interference aspect, not least because some would calculate anyway it might be their turn next and they don't want to set precedents. And the non-Western major powers, for example, Russia and China, do not see it as their job, or indeed as anyone's job, to be international policemen. And again, they have concerns to protect the sovereignty principle in case the precedents are used against them in their own backyard at some point. And this more or less automatic Western lead that we have in current circumstances means that the motives of humanitarian intervention promoters are suspect even when they're really only inspired by genuinely altruistic concerns about human rights or humanitarian suffering. <coughs>
Now, a third major question about all this, and it's a critical one, although it's often ignored, is who is actually going to carry out an intervention, even assuming one is agreed? If the Security Council authorises a military intervention, that may well be the beginning of the argument, not the end of it. Some country or countries or some organisation is going to have to agree to put their soldiers in harm's way. To bear the financial costs, which may be very considerable over a long period of time unless it becomes a UN peacekeeping operation as such, and to withstand all the undoubted political and other pressures which are going to be brought to bear. There is no United Nations or other standing international force which can be used, and uh, in truth there is no prospect of anyone being agreed or established for a mixture of political and financial reasons. And this means that, for example, even if the, all the alarm bells had been rung in time over Rwanda and the Security Council had agreed to authorise a military intervention, who would actually be willing to take this on and could they have mobilised an effective force in time to stop it? Moreover, since Rwanda, as we've already seen, the Iraq operation has poisoned the well pretty uh, thoroughly when it comes to willingness to put troops into other countries, except in the most exceptional circumstances. Look at what the United States have said about their own participation in the Libyan operation and the remark of Robert Gates about anyone advocating US intervention in another Middle East country needing to have their head examined. But despite all this and despite those reservations, the reality is that if something is going to be done in a particular case, it will almost certainly have to be done by Western organisations and countries, uh, organisations such as NATO. And of course, this increases suspicion in other parts of the world that the whole business is some kind of Western conspiracy to impose their own, own views and to deal with regimes they don't like under the disguise of humanitarian concerns. Our fourth area of difficulty, do we really understand the situation we're dealing with and all the local dynamics well enough to make a military intervention effective? and just as important to sustain it over time. Can we really tell the good guys from the bad guys? And do we know how to build back a nation after we've intervened? If we can get together the kind of military force needed, we can usually do the immediate mili military operation reasonably well and quickly. When I say we, I mean Western military capacity and technology, as we've seen in some cases. But we have proved singularly bad, indeed inept, at the next bit, of creating some kind of political consensus and some kind of sustainable economic, political and social system out of the mess that we've created. And of course capacity and technology are in any case much less effective when it comes to asymmetrical warfare against non-state actors. The examples of both Iraq and Afghanistan are eloquent in all these regards. Now this is not actually because people are stupid or incompetent although bad mistakes were made in both those cases, it's more that it's genuinely extremely difficult to come in from the outside and to create or help create a new situation, a new system, in a situation where even with good experts to help, and experts are not always listened to, the nuances of, for example, the existing economic and social networks are simply hard to understand and to operate successfully alongside. <coughs> Old-fashioned colonial powers could usually manage this in one way or another simply through a combination of brutality because there was no outside media to watch or care uh, and because they were very cunning at some, uh, some uh, points in co-opting parts of the existing system. But nowadays countries have no desire to stay long enough to understand this or to change everything. It costs too much in blood and treasure apart from anything else and there's no colonial instinct at work in the same way in any case. So for good reasons, interveners now are looking for quick wins and effective exit strategies from day one. So it's hardly surprising in these complicated circumstances that we're not doing very well in this area. The truth is that nation building is really hard. So those are five very difficult points about humanitarian intervention. They're not designed, uh, not intended to demolish the case for, inter for humanitarian intervention in the right circumstances, but they are intended to bring out the difficulty of the concept and the difficulty of its implementation uh, in practice. <coughs> now where does all this leave us with what we're facing today in Libya? Libya is in many ways the first action using this, these responsibility to protect principles since they were adopted at the UN in 2005. Now the immediate aim was clear and I think clearly humanitarian to save the population of Benghazi and other rebel held cities from imminent attack and presumed massacre by Colonel Gaddafi's forces. The operation was explicitly approved by the Security Council in Resolution 1973, much to people's surprise, not least because of regional support, particularly from the Arab League. It therefore had 
legitimacy. There were forces from Western countries prepared to carry it out, and it did achieve its immediate aim of saving the civilian populations of the threatened cities. So far, so good, and these are very important points that we need to keep in mind. But many questions still arise. Let me list five of the main ones. First of all, how deep is international support for this operation? Some of those who voted for the Security Council resolution, and even more so some of those who abstained, like Russia and China, now seem much less sure of their vote or actively regret it. And the Arab League's support for the operation, for example, has been, for the most part, pretty theoretical. Secondly, can an air operation alone achieve the declared objective of protecting civilians over time? As I've suggested, there are very good reasons why Western countries don't want to finish up with boots on the ground in Libya, with the Iraq example in mind. And I certainly am not advocating this. But there are bound to be questions about an operation which has its hands tied in this way from the start. Many have argued that in circumstances like these, we should either go in properly or we should stay out altogether. A halfway house threatens to become the worst of all possible worlds. Mission creep, we can see, is already alive and well and living in Libya because of the obvious limitations of the current air-only intervention. Thirdly, how far is protection of civilians really the ultimate object of the operation? Now, to ask this question is not actually to doubt the sincerity of those who mounted it or to suggest that there's some kind of neo-imperial or oil-related aim in mind. Those are silly arguments, as actually they were in the case of Iraq too. Rather, the issue is whether the objective was bound to be, or at least to turn out to be, the removal of the present regime because there can be no real protection of civilians short of that. Regime change was definitely not the aim of the Security Council resolution, and respect has to be paid to that. But the Western countries most involved have nevertheless made very clear that they don't see how Libya's current problems can be resolved without the removal of Gaddafi and his immediate circle. So is not what we've in fact done been to take sides in a Libyan civil war whose dynamics we understand very imperfectly at best? So is the real aim regime change or not? And we've been through this ambiguity before in Iraq. Fourthly, and perhaps most importantly in some ways, why are we intervening in Libya, but manifestly not interested in doing so elsewhere in the region, for example in Syria, where the repression of peaceful protesters has been little, if at all, better? And this argument can, of course, be extended to situations again outside the region, such as North Korea or Zimbabwe or many others. And this is, as I say, in many ways the most difficult question. And naturally, each case is different, and there are many reasons why we might worry about instability in Syria and its immediate neighbourhood more than in Libya, and why intervention there will be much more difficult in every possible way. It's already clear, for example, that the Security Council would not repeat its Libyan vote in the Syrian, or indeed in any other uh, likely current case in the region. So how far does this inconsistency matter? Perfect consistency in foreign policy, I know from my experience, is certainly unattainable. But there is a requirement for a minimum of consistency and an absence of two obvious double standards without which the motives of interveners are going to be even more suspect than they would be otherwise. The main answer given to this charge of inconsistency is that just because it's not possible to intervene everywhere doesn't mean you should not intervene anywhere. And this is, I think, a powerful argument which you have to deal with. But it's not powerful enough to still all doubts about why we've chosen one situation in which to intervene over the others. Fifthly, how is this all going to end? In other words, what's the exit strategy? And here there are no answers for the moment. Now the reality is that whatever journalistic commentators might wish, it's not possible in the real world to know in advance the ways in which events are going to turn out. On the other hand, the kind of stalemate we see in the military situation in Libya was not hugely difficult to predict. Now, it may be that, as the coalition has argued, time is on the side of the rebels and the international intervention. But how much time is going to be needed, and do we have the will and resources to see this through? Again, a difficult question to answer. So finally, how far does the intervention in Libya match up to the original Blair Doctrine? Let's have a quick look at the five tests I talked about at the beginning. First of all, are we sure of our case? Well. Colonel Gaddafi and his regime do not find many defenders, rightly I would argue, and saving Benghazi was not difficult to agree with. But the doubts about the end game, and even more so in many ways, the doubts about the nature and motives of some of the rebels with whom we've effectively sided, mean that the case is not as watertight as would be ideal.
Have we exhausted all diplomatic options? Well, there may not have been many in these circumstances, given the nature of the regime and the threats they were making. And if Benghazi was to be saved in practice, there was no time or opportunity to negotiate. But the truth is that we have not really shown much willingness to negotiate and have stuck to the mantra that nothing is possible unless Gaddafi actually goes. So not a very satisfactory answer here either. Thirdly, are there military operations we can sensibly and prudently undertake? Yes, in the sense that we can conduct an air campaign at little risk to ourselves and to some good effect on the ground. No, in the sense that, as I've already suggested, by ruling out a ground assault, we have made achieving our aims much more difficult. And there's a comparison with Kosovo uh, in, 99, uh, in 1999 here. The air campaign against uh, President Milosevic achieved relatively little, despite claims at the time. And it was only the threat of a ground assault about which then US President Clinton had hesitated long and hard to put it in Ohio. It was only that threat which eventually turned the tide, together, in fact, with Russia pulling a diplomatic plug on President Milosevic. Are we prepared for the long term? Another one of the Blair tests. Well, the powers which have intervened have no choice for now but to go on with the operation. Now they've launched it. But doubts will inevitably grow over time. Do we have the resources and the will to see this through at a time, for example, in Britain of defence cuts and many other difficulties? And if Gaddafi does fall, how far do we, are we prepared or do we want to get involved in what comes next? Should we try to influence this or leave it entirely to the Libyans themselves, at the risk, albeit a small one perhaps, hopefully, of a regime emerging which may not be much better? Not an easy question to answer. Finally, do we have national interests involved? It's not in fact obvious to me that we do, at least in any narrow sense. I'm talking about Britain here particularly. Some have pointed to Libyan oil or our commercial interests in Libya. But again, if we wanted to keep down the oil price in general, or have access to Libyan oil in particular, you'd be doing anything but what we're doing now. It's certainly in our broad national interest that democracy spreads in the region and that human rights are more universally respected. We should certainly, I would argue, support the Arab Spring uh, firmly in general. I'm confident overall that good things will come out of it. But one of the main things, one of the best things about the Arab Spring is that it's genuinely homegrown. The wrong kind of assistance from us will not necessarily help the right result be achieved, and it would be disastrous if the protesters' cause came to be tainted by the label of Western support. I think that's not the case so far, but we do need to be very careful about this. So all in all, and having looked at those five tests and some of the concerns I've already raised, it's not difficult to have a lot of concerns about the humanitarian intervention in Libya, however decent the motives of those people who were behind it. So should we have done it? Well, to be honest with you, that's hard to say for now. In any case, we are where we are. It's happened. We have to make the best of it. In the longer term, the real answer will only come when we know the outcome. If Gaddafi falls reasonably quickly without a prolonged civil war and lots more bloodshed, and if the government which follows seems a lot more democratic and effective, and if this encourages others to continue their demands for reasonable change elsewhere, peacefully, the intervention will be seen as a success. If Gaddafi does not fall, the country becomes effectively divided, the rebels prove incapable of providing reasonable government even for the part of the country they already control, and the experience discovers, discourages promotion of peaceful change elsewhere, it will be seen as a failure. Now, the outcome may well, of course, be much messier than either of these two clear-cut scenarios. So I would argue that the jury is well and truly out on where we're going to get to. Let me just repeat, repeat that my overall conclusion is not that we should give up on the idea of humanitarian intervention despite all these problems I've drawn attention to. It has to remain a tool in the international community's toolbox for the last resort, completely unacceptable Rwanda-style situations. Nor do I think it's possible or is, it, or is going to be possible to lay down in advance hard and fast rules for such interventions. Each case will be sui generis and each case has to involve elements of political and other judgment at the time which cannot be over-specified or completely re regulated by pretending that international law is like national law and could cover every eventuality. But I do believe that because outside intervention, as we've seen in recent years, raises so many short-term problems and so many long-term issues, whenever this question arises, we must think through all the angles very carefully indeed, even where events are moving very fast before we intervene. We need to reflect on whether we really know what we're doing, 
and what we are trying to achieve, whether the goal is achievable, whether we are the right people to be trying to achieve it, and what the broader consequences are likely to be. So will Libya, will Libya prove to be the first of many similar interventions in the future, or the last hooray for the idea of Western responsibility to be the policeman of the world? The latter may, in my view, be more likely than the former, but the jury is still out on that too, and is likely to be out for some time to come. Meanwhile, the arguments will go on, including no doubt now, and I'm ready to answer your, uh, hear to your, listen to your comments and uh, answer your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>